Thank you very much. Uh, I think this is the fanciest auditorium that I've ever sp spoken to. I'm hope, hoping to be up to the task. So, typing protocol, type hints as we do intended. The title of the talk is a reference to this t-shirt, which I wish I, I wish I had, but I don't, right? Programming the way we do indented it. <clears throat> so, <laughs> so yeah, that's my book. Um, every, almost everything that I'm going to show you today came out of a, a lot of research that I did while writing the book. The second edition has more than 100 pages about type hints and other new stuff. So uh, we're going to talk about four things. What is a type? The four modes of typing. Some typing protocol examples and a conclusion, okay? So, what is a type? <clears throat> so this is a direct quote from PEP 483, the theory of type hints, which was written by Guido von Hossum and uh, Ivan Levitsky, Lev 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 Levkivsky. So there are many definitions of the concept of type in the literature. Here we assume that type is a set of values and a set of functions that one can apply to those values, right? Uh, for me, my first understanding of types was very, mo very much focused on, on the, the set of values, because you think about, oh, okay, so you have the set of the complex numbers, and then you have the real numbers, and then you have the uh, integers, and so on. But that's in the beautiful, pure world of mathematics. In the real world, there are some small issues, right? Reality is complicated. Reality is more complicated than math. So I have an integer, and then I convert it to a float. Looks all right, except that one is not equal to the other. Right? Actually, in the set of floats, <laughs> there is no float that represents precisely that number. And if you import the decimal module, it, it can, when, you, when, you, in, when you create uh, an instance of decimal, it shows you then a string representation with full precision. And as you can see, they are not really the same number, although they are pretty close, right? <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, a little side note. It's interesting that the float type uh, has, been, has been around for a long time. It's basically embedded in all modern CPUs, right? The, all the basic operations with floats are embedded in the CPUs. But it's a type that is more useful to scientists and engineers than for people, for instance, who uh, deal with money. Right, which is, I guess, most of us, or many of us, I don't know. So I, I, I always thought, thought it was kind of weird that uh, uh, most mainstream languages don't have a really good way of representing money, uh, and people try to use float for that, but it's not great. So decimal is an alternative in Python to do that. <laughs> But the, the set of values definition is not useful for other reasons also. Because Python does not provide practical ways to specify types as sets of values, except for enum. In practice, in the standard library, we have very small sets, like uh, the set of the none type, which has only one instance, none. Bool, which has two instances. And then, on the other hand, you have extremely large ones with billions of, of uh, instances, right? Uh, the int and the string types, for example, the, the possible values are only limited by uh, the, the, the width of the pointer in the machine. Uh, so, and, and also, we have no way to say, for instance, that a quantity type that I would like to use, for instance, in an e-commerce application to validate that orders are not placed with zero of an item, 
or more than 1,000, this could be an interesting safety measure, right? Usually, it's rare that you order 1,000 or, or more of something in a retail uh, store. So you can't say that. There is no way in, the, in Python to say that in the, in the type system to express that, right? Uh, for instance, also there's no way to say that our airport code is the set of all the 17,576 uh, three-letter combinations of uppercase uh, ASCII letters. There's, neither of those sets can be expressed in the, in the type systems. Uh, at least not in the type systems of mainstream languages and certainly not in the type system of Python. So, in practice, it's more useful to think that int is a subtype of float because it implements the same interface. Basically, the, the interface of float has to do with uh, arithmetic, and all the operations also apply to integers, right? Uh, and, uh, but ints also have a few other methods, like, for instance, those that do bitwise manipulation, shift right, shift left, things that wouldn't make sense in a, in a float. So that's the main reason why we, we can think of int as a, as a subset of, uh, not, not a subset, a subtype of float, because it implements all the types, all the, the, the entire interface of float and an additional few methods. I put a couple of asterisks here because <laughs> Just yesterday, I discovered there are a few float methods that int does not implement, okay, but they are kind of uh, bizarre. One of them is one that generates a, an hexadecimal representation of the, of, the, of the float. But anyway, as a good approximation, we can think of subtypes, and in general, that's true for subtypes, that they implement the entire interface of the supertype in addition to more methods, right? Uh, so for instance, here I continue that example by showing that the pipe operator, which is the bitwise OR, you can use it with an integer, but you cannot use it with a float, right? And another example of how uh, it's more useful to think about the, the interface is that in, in Python's uh, static type system, uh, we have now the any type. And, and, and basically, because any value can be assigned to an object variable, and any value can be assigned to an any variable, you can say that you know, they are like the universe types, right? Uh, but the, 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 the super important difference between them is that the object type implements a narrow interface, right? Pretty much every sub uh, most subclasses that we create from objects add methods, right, that don't exist in, in objects. Uh, but any, on the other hand, is this magical type that is required because of the uh, because of the nature of the gradual type system that we have, which means that you know sometimes you, you, you may have a piece of code that is not annotated, uh, or you're using a library, a third-party library that is not annotated, so you get a result from there, and all that the, the, the type checker can infer is that the return is any, right? And any satisfies every interface. It's like this magical interface that contains all possible methods that exist today or that will ever exist, right? So this is a crucial difference between them. So in general, if you think of, of subtypes as sets, you get uh, the, the biggest set is in the top, right? Object is the set of everything, and then you go down, 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 down to more specific types, more specialized types that usually have fewer instances. But on the other hand, the interface grows, right? At the top of the of our class hierarchy, the interface is narrower, and as you go down, it gets wider, more specialized, and gets more methods. <clears throat> So 
So from that definition of PEP483, we are going to adopt that point of view that a set is a set of functions that one can apply to those values. A set is defined by the set of functions that you can apply to, a, to an object, right? And then here's another, another quote from, uh, from Smalltalk. And I'm not talking about Smalltalk just because I have a, a gray beard. I'm talking about Smalltalk because it's really very, it's the type system of Smalltalk is very similar to the type system of Python. Uh, just like the type system of Ruby and the type system of JavaScript. Uh, uh, and in the small talk community, they, they, they use this term protocol, right? So this, this, this quote is from one of the designers of small talk. Every object in small talk, even a lowly integer, has a set of messages, a protocol, that defines the explicit communication to which that object can respond. Um, in small talk, there was no ex explicit way to declare a protocol, but some uh, browsers that you use to code, to code in small talk did present uh, clusters of methods uh, as a protocol. Uh, and of course, a class could implement several protocols. So that was uh, the way they used it, more as, a, as metadata for the programmer than something that was checked, right? So the main takeaways from this first part is that types are defined by interfaces, and protocol is a synonym for interface, right? So that's where the name, from, the, the name of the typing protocol class that we're going to talk about comes from. Now let's talk about uh, duck typing. So last time I looked, uh, Alex Martelli, who is my friend and also one of the uh, reviewers of the first edition of my book, is credited, was credited by Wikipedia for being the first person who used in a written message that you can find online, uh, this duck metaphor. I, I don't know if he invented it, but he was the first one who used it in a, in a, in a Python mailing list to talk about, you know, to respond to a question about polymorphism that had to do with type checking in Python, you know, many years ago when there was no static typing, right? So the, 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 the idea is that you don't check whether something is a duck. You check whether it quacks like a duck or walks like a duck, etc. depending on exactly what subset of duck-like behavior you need, right? I started using Python in 98, and at the time there was no ABCs. There were no ABCs in the standard library. So uh, in the beginning I was a little bit uh, mystified by the appearance of, of phrases like, oh, this function takes a file-like object. Mm, okay, what is that? There was no definition anywhere, right? But it was a common practice to, to, to have these kinds of, uh, of expressions. I think there's, there's still uh, phrases like that in the documentation. A buffer-like object is another thing that is super important for data science. There was a, then there was some formalization of what that means, but <clears throat> uh, the interesting thing is the precise meaning of a file-like object depended on the context, right? Sometimes all, all you needed was, I need something that has a read method that returns bytes, for instance. That's file-like enough for me in this moment. Does that make sense? In another situation, maybe you need something that has a closed method or a right method, things like that, right? But it was always very, very informal, similar to how it was informal in, in small talk as well. So one definition that you can give if somebody asks you what's the difference between a, 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 
uh, a protocol in an in interface, uh, you know, if we are not talking about static typing, you can say that pr protocols traditionally were informal interfaces that were not defined explicitly in code, but where, but, uh, where the code depended on one of uh, those interfaces or on a few methods to do something. Right? So, for instance, when I, I, I've taught Python to lots of people, and most of my students over time came from uh, st uh, statically typed languages like uh, Java, mostly, and C, C sharp. And so I always like to show them this example of a very a simple function, double, to illustrate uh, duck typing, right? So I create this single function, double, and I can, I can use it with uh, an int, with a float, with a uh, complex, with fractions, and those are all numbers, but I can also use it with sequences, right? So. What is the, the idea here? What is the, the protocol that Double expects X to fulfill? Double expects that the argument X is able to multiply itself by an integer. That's what is implicit in that code, and this is why all of those objects support that, because under the covers, they implement a method called dunder move, right? So uh, dunder, double underscore in front, behind, and uh, the, some special name. Dunder move is the is the actually is actually the method that any class that you write can implement to support the the multiplication sign, this operator, right? Now, here's another example, a more dramatic example. So I have this simple class that represents a train, okay? And its only attribute is a, a length that is uh, established when it's constructed. And so then we have the dunderlen method that returns the length, and we have the dunderGetItem method. Um, and basically it checks whether the, the i is uh, within the range, right, from zero to length minus one, and if it is, then it returns a string saying car number such and such, right? Otherwise it raises index error. So for instance, uh, if I have a if I build a train with three cars, and I ask the length of the train, I get three. So this is duck typing, right? Notice this class inherits uh, implicitly from objects. There's no other special class that I'm using here. So what makes something work with length in Python is uh, basically, for built teams, Python has a shortcut, okay? built-in and extensions, like extensions written in C or Rust or, C or uh, other languages, can implement in, in those lower level, using this, the Python C API, what is called a slot uh, that will uh, respond to the LAN. But even if you don't do that, there is also you know, some, uh, it's funny because the C code of Python is kind of object-oriented C, okay? Not C++, object-oriented C. There's this kind of a nested structures uh, in which the, everything that has a, a len, everything that has multiple items in it, uh, has a field that Python can inspect immediately to know how many items there are, okay? So that's very fast because it doesn't involve any method call. But if that uh, field doesn't exist, then Python will try and find whether there is a Dunderlen implementation either in the uh, low-level language or in Python if it's a Python object, right? So that's how Len works. 
Uh, and it's an example of duct typing, right? You don't need to inherit from anything to implement, to support LAN, you just implement that method. The second example is uh, uh, what triggers the dunder get item method, right? Uh, <clears throat> and again, another example of, of duck typing. But the, the, the third example is really dramatic because uh, the, the, the target of a for loop, uh, in this case the, the, the T, is supposed to implement an interface of iterable, right? Uh, and how do you implement the interface of iterable? Formally, you implement a dunder iter method that returns uh, an iterator, which, by, which is another interface that implements a dunder next method. However, I didn't implement the underiter here. Okay. Well, anyway, in regular, in a regular duck-typed language, you would uh, any class that would implement the underiter would work for iteration. But Python goes even further than that because that's so fundamental. Uh, uh, iteration is so fundamental to the language, and also to support legacy code. It's, it, it just so happens that. Uh, the Python machinery, this is actually built in the iter built in function. The, the iter built in function looks to see if the object implements the under iter, but if it doesn't, then there's a fallback. And the fallback is does it implement the under get item? And then it tries to send uh, a zero, you know, to it tries to call the under get item with a zero argument. And if that works, then it starts iterating by providing more indexes until the under get item returns index error, right? So this is kind of an extreme example of duck typing, right? Of the, the machinery of the language trying to use the, the object even when the object doesn't implement one particular interface, it falls back to another interface and, and does what you expect, right? <clears throat> okay, so now I'm gonna show the first example of a, of, a, of a protocol. And this I think is the best example of a protocol in the, in the whole talk. Uh, it's, the, it's the most similar to the kinds of protocols that you are likely to use in your, in your job. So what I'm saying here is I have a function called run file and it takes one argument called source file, which is a text reader. And then immediately above, there's a definition, right, of a class that inherits from protocol, right? And that definition is exactly like, it's, like I wrote it here. The, the ellipsis in line 203 is part of the syntax, okay? The ellipsis is telling you that uh, uh, the body is omitted. Instead of pass, which explicitly say, says, this doesn't do anything, it, what, what this is saying is, uh, the, the body will be defined somewhere else. It doesn't matter what the body is. So, in order to satisfy that, uh, that protocol, a, an object, any object in the world can satisfy that, that protocol by implementing a read method that returns a string. That's it, okay? So, and often you, 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 you will see code like that where the interface is defined right above the place where it's used. This is common. We see that a lot in Go code. And why, why am I talking about Go code? Because Go is the first mainstream language that, ha that is statically typed but also supports this idea uh, of declaring uh, protocols. Uh, notice that whatever, cla whatever class I use to pass, to, to produce a, a, a text reader doesn't need to inherit. And in fact, they won't inherit from text reader. All they have to do is to implement the interface, okay? So 
The benefits of using typing protocol are that you can preserve the flexibility of duck typing. Uh, so you can let your clients know what is the minimal interface expected regardless of, of class hierarchies. You can support static analysis, right? IDEs and linters can verify that an actual argument that appears in a call site for that uh, run file function does, imp does satisfy the, imp the, the protocol, right? And you reduce coupling because the, the client classes don't need to subclass anything, just implement the, pro the protocol. And this also makes testing easier, right? Because in, if, if you need to create some kind of mock to test, all you have to do is implement that one method. You don't need to inherit from anything, right? So let's talk about the four modes of typing. We all know there's this duality between you know, static typing and dynamic typing. And this has to do with when the types are checked, right? Static typing is designed to support static checking, which is checking done by tools and compilers and so on. And runtime checking is, uh, uh, I mean, dynamic typing is, it was invented to support runtime checking, right? The authors of the, of the type of the uh, type hints PEP promise that Python will remain dynamically typed, okay? But actually the situation is more interesting than this. The situation is that we have uh, this ac these two axes where besides the static checking and runtime checking, we also have the, the issue of how the types are defined or identified. So in static typing of languages like Java, you have nominal types. Things belong to a type because it's explicitly declared. You inherit from something or you implement an interface, right? But with duck typing, what we have is structural types, which means objects belong to a type because they implement a certain interface but they don't need to explicitly declare anywhere that they do implement. They just have to actually implement it, right? So these are like the two opposites. But this diagram actually has other, other areas. This area, uh, Alex Martelli, when uh, he was uh, reviewing my first, the first edition of my book, he, he invented this term goose typing. I'm not, I don't have time to talk about that, but basically that's the use of ABCs to do explicit type checks at runtime, uh, and then uh, Lucas Langa and others, uh, Lucas is speaking right now at another room here, they uh, proposed PEP, 44, PEP 544, which implements structural duct typing or the idea of, I mean, structural subtyping or the idea of static duct typing, right? Duck typing, static duck typing. So, and that's supported by typing protocol, okay? There are other languages that, that support things in those quadrants. See, Go appears in the static duck, duck typing quadrant, but also in the goose typing quadrant because it has mechanisms for type assertions at runtime, and so on, okay? So let's see some more examples. We were talking about the double function. How do we, how could we annotate that with a protocol? So can we do that? Yeah, okay, the, this, this has a serious problem. The problem is the type checker will complain that the object type doesn't implement the other move. Does that make sense? So this code, Without looking at anywhere else, the type checker knows that this code is invalid, okay? Can I use any? Yes, but it's useless because it's the same thing as no annotation. Uh, the any uh, annotation pretty much defeats type checking. You have to use it very carefully and like an emergency exit. Uh, I could do this and say that uh, X is a sequence of T. 
And here I have to introduce this idea of the type var, right? Because uh, uh, sequence is, is a generic uh, uh, abstract based class, so I ha I, I'm, I'm saying this. If I get a sequence of, of floats, I'm going to return a sequence of floats. If I get a sequence of strings, I'm going to return a sequence of strings. This is what the type variable is doing, right? When the type checker analyzes this, it gets a, you know, a concrete example of a call site. It looks at the type of the, of the, of the elements in the sequence, and then it binds T to that type, and then it will un, un, infer that the return is a sequence of that same type, okay? So this only works with sequences. It doesn't work with numbers. So the solution is to create a, a repeatable protocol. So the repeatable protocol is saying that uh, it's anything that implements the under move and that takes a repeat count, which is an integer, okay? And now I can say that X is a repeatable and this returns a repeatable. Are we done yet? No. Because now, when I call double, the result that I get is inferred to be something that only implements the under move. And if you need to do other kinds of operations with the object, you won't be able to. The, the, the type checker won't let you. Of course, at runtime, everything happens, right? Because that's the characteristic of, of uh, the gradual type system of Python. At runtime, only the dynamic types exist. There's no constraint. But the type checker will point out that, you know, if you try to do something else with this result, no, this result only supports the move because that's what it says. So the way to solve this is a little bit more involved. You need to, to create another type var. So the protocol is the same, okay? The new thing here is this type var here. And here I'm saying that RT can be bound to any type, but it has to be limited by, I don't like the, the keyword argument bound. I think they should have used another word for this, maybe limited or upper bound or something. But because there's this, the binding of the variable and the bounds, which is kind of a, a boundary, right? What it, this is saying is that we, RT can only accept something that is repeatable. But because of the way that this uh, variable is declared, the actual type of it will be preserved as well. So if I, if I pass a float, this will, uh, the, the type checker will be able to infer, first it will, be, it will, it will accept the float because the float implements the under move, and it will uh, understand that this returns a float, okay? So that's uh, one thing that we need to do in this case. So when I discovered these things, I was doing research for the book, and that was the time of Python 3.8 when typing protocol was introduced. There, there's this project called TypeShed, right, which has the type annotations for the standard library and other projects. And I, I contributed several fixes by, by implementing protocols there. So for instance, this, there was this bug that I found that there's a, a the medium low, the medium low uh, function in the statistics module actually works with strings, with a list of strings, okay? And there's an example just like that in the documentation. So, but it wasn't, but at the time, we had a false positive, which was, that if I pass, if I submitted this code to a type check, it would complain. And why is that? Because the, the annotation at the time was saying that uh, the argument had to be an iterable of a iterable of number. And number was a, a type that they invented there, which was the union of int, float, and complex, I think, or int, float, and, and fraction, I think. Anyway, it didn't work with, with strings, the annotation, although the function did work with strings, right? So the solution was to create this sortable uh, protocol. And again, you see the same formula that we saw before. 
right? You have a protocol and you have uh, a type var which is bound to that protocol and then I can use that type var to say that median low accepts an iterable of sortable t which is the type, the type var uh, bound to sortable and it returns a sortable t, right? When I, when I contribute that, that I, I looked around and I found many other places in the Python 3.9 standard library where we could improve the annotations by using protocols, okay? And then there was the biggest challenge for me at the time was the max function. The max function is super powerful, right? I, like I said, I've taught Python many times. I never saw a student say that, oh, max is super complicated to understand, no. It's pretty simple. You can pass it uh, an iterable or uh, a series of arguments, and then if it's an iterable, then you, it, it will return the biggest uh, item in the iterable. If it's a series of arguments, it will return the, the biggest of the, of the arguments, right? But then there is some optional arguments and so on. So it's very flexible, easy to use. I like this API, okay, but then Somebody posted a, a bug about that, and I tried to fix it. The old type hints were like that. So overload is something that comes, this decorator comes from the typing uh, module, and its, its uh, mission is to allow you to, dec to, to do multiple type annotations uh, to different ways of invoking a single function, right? So it was already pretty complicated. My time is running up, so I'm not gonna delve into the details here. But this wasn't working. This was producing that uh, bug that this person reported. The bug was that uh, if you passed five and top where top was none, it exploded. Uh, and the solution was this. It took me several hours, actually a couple of days, and with support of people more experienced than I in the type system to get to this. My first attempt had eight overloads, then uh, one of the maintainers of type shed showed me how to simplify and reduce it to only six. <laughs> okay, in order to do that, because Max is written in C, I wrote it in Python uh, to test and so on. And what caught my attention was that my implementation was shorter than the declarations to satisfy the type checker, okay? So there was a lot of stuff that happened after that. If you go look at the code, it's not like that anymore. I won't go into these details here, but it's just for, uh, you, know, for you to know that with time, super supports less than became supports greater than, and then they invented another name, and then they created, now what they are using is supports rich comparison, which is a union type of supports dunder LT and supports dunder GT, which means that uh, in most of those functions that appear in this uh, list here that have to do with ordering stuff, what they do is they accept, the current annotations accept something that supports either less than or greater than, either way it will work. Okay. There are some protocols in the standard library. Uh, most of them have to do with no numbers because unfortunately the numeric tower, remember the numeric tower? It's completely broken for use with type, typing. And why? Because the base class of the numeric tower, which is called number, has no methods, <laughs> which means that objects of that class are useless. You can't do anything with them. So, but anyway, so they invented those uh, uh, protocols that have to do with whether something supports a conversion, right? And one of them, for instance, I use in, a, in one example in the book, which is supports index. Supports index is a particular uh, protocol that means that the object implements dunder index which as opposed to dunder int, which floats also support uh, to convert to int, dunder, uh, dunder index is supposed to be implemented only by integral types. So for instance, if you use NumPy, 
all the integral types of NumPy supports uh, implement the Dunder index method, so they can use, be used as indexes. Okay. So to summarize, uh, I recommend that you use typing protocol to build Pythonic APIs. In fact, you can say that the standard library is very Pythonic, although there are parts of it that I don't consider very Pythonic, but most of it is very Pythonic. And the standard library really cannot be annotated without the use of typing protocols, right? So you, you should use typing protocol because then you can support duct typing with type hints. And duct typing is the essence of Python's data model and standard library. This allows you to follow the integrate segre segregation prin principle, the I in, the, in the, the solid principles, which means that client code should not be forced to depend on methods that it does not use. You know, I remember when I used to code in Java, sometimes you had to implement methods just to satisfy the compiler, right? Uh, and this is a recommendation that I learned from studying Go, okay? Uh, pro narrow protocols are the best, okay? Most protocols that come in the Go standard library have only one method, and that's how your protocol should, should uh, do as well. That's why trying to think of an interface in terms of an ABC or a Java interface with the many methods is not a good way of getting started with designing a protocol, okay? Closing words. I have to say these things every time that I talk about Python typing, okay? Being optional is not a bug or a limitation of Python type hints. It's the feature that gives us the power to cope with the inherent complexities, annoyances, flaws, and limitations of static types. So please, do not decide in your team that everything has to have type hints always. Okay, that's the only way to use a type checker in this, is in the strictest possible mode. This is really bad. It's like uh, deciding that every code has to be 100% test covered. No, 95% is good enough a lot of times, okay? So that was my talk. Thank you so much. I don't know if we have time to, for questions. Maybe one question. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for one question. Uh, just remember to go to the microphone so that everybody can hear it. Yes, please. Hey, obrigado. Thank you for your talk, Lucian. Um, asking as a beginner in typing, I could not follow why when we define the repeatable protocol, why do we say that MOL will return something that's also repeatable? Why don't I say that I'm just returning anything? Let me see. So. The repeatable pro this? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. So what's the, the specific question? Why am I saying that Dunder Mool will return T? Is it, is it something that I decide, or is it the, typically the thing that makes sense? Yes, it's something that you decide, but this is how uh, I, it, 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 this is how I see the, because the, the idea of this double function is that it repeats something. If it's a number, that means multiplying by two, but if, if, if it's a sequence, it's repeating it. And that's actually how, why I called it repeatable and repeat counting. In, in both of those cases, the type will be the same, the, the output type will be the same as the input type. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Actually, this is the, the right solution, right? Sorry. That one was, has the problem, and the, this one is the one that is uh, correct because it uses the bound type var. Okay? Okay, so uh, you can uh, catch up with uh, Luciano uh, well, during coffee break or during lunch. Thank yeah. you very much for the presentation, and Thank let's uh, give him a round of applause. All right.